good help is hard to find, so I guess I better get with the program. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I was waiting for, something, something else, I suppose. So anyway, good morning and welcome, welcome to First Christian Church on this first day of August. Fall's going to be here before we know it, so thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. We're especially appreciative for our visitors who have joined us. There's a tear-off sheet in your bulletin. If you wouldn't mind filling out that tear-off sheet for uh, visitors, you can include it in the offering tray later in the service. And we hope you, you can hang around for just a couple of minutes after the service to, to give us an opportunity to meet you. The resurgence of COVID is keeping many of our members close to home as a precaution against the virus, but we are very thankful for all who've joined us, whether it's in person here today or online. For those of you attending in person, please remember to t turn off your cell phone uh, so we will have a stronger internet, internet feed for those watching online. Please also sign the attendance register so we will have a record of your attendance. Psalm 28, seven tells us, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy with my song I praise him. As we gather to worship and praise God, we are assured of God's presence and help for us. If you're able, please stand and join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin, and then continue standing for the invocation uh, and hymn. Yet he gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of the heavens. He rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. He let loose the east wind from the heavens and by his power made the south wind blow. He made them come down inside their camp all around their tents. Good morning, church. Is this a lovely Seattle day? Oh, that's right, I'm right in Seattle. Okay. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious, almighty, all powerful, all loving God. Lord, we come into this place to worship you, to worship you and to bless your holy name because you are God all by yourself. Lord, we thank you for the many, many things you've done for us, but Lord, we thank you for simply being who you are and what you are. Lord, let this worship be pleasing in your sight, Lord. That's what we desire. We want to do whatever pleases you. We don't have a lot of time, we say, but we have time for the things we want to do. Lord, so we, so we set aside this time because this is something we want to do is praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, I pray. Let us repeat the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
second. Oh, good. I asked that the children come down for children's moment this morning. Can y'all come help me? I'd appreciate it. Wow, y'all look good. Welcome. How you feel today? Good. Do you know what? I am just happy. Y'all can sit on those steps, and then I'm going to get you to help me do something in a minute, okay? Um, I'm just happy. You know why? I woke up, and it was thundering, and it rained. And you know what else? Today is God's day, and we get to come into this house and worship him. That's a, that's a good thing. Well, I brought some snacks today, okay? All right. Does anybody like dog treats? You don't? I bet Cleo would like a dog treat. But we, we'd rather have a cookie or a cake or a fruit snack. That'd be a lot better. Do you have a dog? Yes. You do? What's your dog's name? Petey. Petey. What is your dog's name? Millie and Lexi. Oh, Millie. You've got two dogs. Wow, that's cool. But... Okay, now what will, a dog will do just about anything for a treat, won't it? Now, usually dogs will, what, roll over? Does your dog bark if you give him a treat? Yeah. Uh, does he sit when you give him a treat? What else does your dog do for a treat? Anything else? Sometimes you always shake. Shake? Wow, I could use, you know, Pastor could use that because she's supposed to be doing something with a hula hoop. You know, she could, she could really learn to shake, okay? Well, I'm not going to give that dog a treat, okay? But we're going to talk about the dog treat. Now, the dog will just do about anything that you want him to do if you have a treat waving in front of him, won't he? We kind of trained him to do that, haven't we? Okay? Well, don't you think that's kind of selfish reason? She, the dog should just love you and do it. Right? Okay. But that's the way we've trained them. Well, you know, sometimes, I bet that's rattling in that microphone. Sometimes we do the same thing to God. We're really nice, and we pray, and we do all the right stuff because, you know why? We think we want a reward from God. But that's not the way God wants us to love him. We want, he wants us to love him in the good times and in the bad times. There was a man in the Bible, and his name was Job. And he's a model for what we should do, okay? He had all kinds of things. He was a very rich man, and he praised God every day for all that he had. But you know what happened? One day, he lost everything that he had. Do you know what he did? He still praised God. Okay? Okay. God doesn't want us to love him like that, to get a reward. He wants us to love him because we love him. He is still God. And he will, he's always with us. He says he'll never leave us. Whenever, in the good times, he rejoices with us. In the bad times, He's there with us to comfort us, to heal us, to have company with, okay? So we need to remember that. There is a Bible verse in John that says, do you know what God does? He says, he rejoices with singing on the top of us because he likes us to love him that much. He likes to see us love him, okay? So how do we praise God? Do you know how we can praise God? Can you think of a way? Can we do it through prayer? We can do it through our words. We can tell people about God, tell it how wonderful he is and how much he means to us. We can sing. The choir sings. On Sunday morning, we sing. Can you imagine God singing over them as they're singing? It's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we can worship God by dancing. Pastor almost went into a dance one Sunday up here. We can do that. We can praise him by dancing. Twirl around in that pretty little dress you have. He'd love it. He would just love it. Uh, we can worship God by coming to his house on Sunday morning and be with all of our church family. Because that's a really big praise, isn't it? We can really praise him that day. 
but we can also praise him by raising our hands. Can you raise your hands and say, praise God? Oh, wonderful. Okay. Now, I promise you I'm not going to give you a dog treat. But I do have these, so I'm going to let you pass the box down. I'm not going to pull it out for you, okay? Can you get one and pass it down? So that each one, each one of y'all can have one, or you can just pass them one. Can you do that for me? Can you help me out? Just pull one out of there and give him one and give her one. I'm sorry I didn't get your names. Okay, everybody has one treat, don't you? Okay, so what are we going to do? Raise your hand. What are we going to say? Praise God. Well, you know, I think I have enough in there for y'all to have two. So get another one. Everybody gets one more. Yay! Now what are we going to do? Put our hands up. What are we going to do? Praise God. Yay! Okay. Can you bow your head with me in prayer, okay? All right. And at the end, will you say amen with me, okay? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this day. We thank thee that you love us so much that you're always with us. Lord, help us to remember to praise you in good times and in bad times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all can go to children's. They need to be released. Charlotte. 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 Oh, oh, sorry. Everyone has needs. Sometimes people have needs that they cannot possibly meet by themselves. Praying for them is a good start, but God also asks that you be his hands and his feet to reach out in a tangible way to help those in need. First, you have to know who they are. Opening your eyes to look for those in your community or even around the world who could use your help is the key to opening your heart then all that is left to do is open your hands. What does God want you to do in a world that will always need more than you can possibly give? Ask him. You are only responsible to do your part, but when you do, you'll discover that when you give in God's name, you also will be blessed. Hart Godwin writes, the true source of cheerfulness is benevolence, the soul that perpetually overflows with kindness and sympathy will always be cheerful. Will the deacons please come forward to accept our tithes and offerings?
us pray. Heavenly Father, open our eyes to the needy at our doorstep in our community and our world and help us to share our time and treasures with them. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. In 1573, the Italian Renaissance painter Paolo Veronese was called before a tribunal of the Catholic Church to answer an accusation of blasphemy. His crime, according to church leaders, was his most recent painting, which showed Christ and his disciples celebrating communion with criminals, vagrants, drunks, in general with people of loose morals and low character. Veronese answered that for him, what made the act of communion so significant and important was its invitation to all people, not just the so-called righteous and powerful, to come to the table and experience the grace of God. He saw the Lord's Supper as a joyous moment of celebration and light, not a judgmental ritual or a ceremony that somehow separated the righteous from everybody else. The painting still exists. It's in a gallery in Venice. Veronese was ordered to repaint parts of it, and it was given the title, The Feast in the House of Levi, after the incident in Matthew chapter 9, when the Pharisees criticized Jesus and the disciples for eating with tax collectors and sinners. When we take communion, we need to be careful not to fall into the same thinking as those who accused Veronese. Communion is not a moment for us to be proud of how righteous we think we are. Instead, Instead, it's a time to reflect and celebrate that a holy God would allow sinners like us to come to his table and find hope and forgiveness. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, 13, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. As disciples of Christ, we acknowledge that all are welcome at this communion meal. Would you please repeat with me our affirmation of faith? I believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of the living God, and I accept him as my Lord and Savior. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Heavenly Father, help us to always remember, as it says in Romans, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Help us to always be grateful and to want to share that good news with others. Amen. I'd like to share with you some joys and concerns. First of all, as a joy, we want to again congratulate Jim Milam and Sarah Newman for being selected as men and women of distinction by the Harrison Daily Times. In past years, there's been a, been a, a, a luncheon in their honor for all honorees. This year, there will not be a luncheon, but the telecast honoring them can be seen beginning this Wednesday at 1030 at the Harrison Daily Times website. So. Uh, we appreciate so much all that Jim and Sarah have done for our community.
Also, we mentioned a couple of weeks ago that, that Virgil's nephew, Bryce Dedman, will be participating in the U.S. Uh, in the in in the Olympics as part of the U.S. track relay team. Now, I was looking for his event. For some reason, I was thinking it was the four by one hundred, which I thought had not been held. Anyway, he he has already participated in one event and won a bronze medal, so that's wonderful news. And of course, typical me, I missed that because I was looking for the wrong event. But he will be participating again this Friday, and it is the four by four hundred relay. That's this Friday. It's uh, Bryce Dedman, so let's all, let's all be watching that and share, share in the celebration and the excitement with the flowers. On a much more serious note, Virgil's brother, Wayne Flowers, who, who had a vaccine and was vaccinated, has been diagnosed with COVID, so, so let's, keep, let's keep him in our prayers. Also, <clears throat> also, you should be aware that Camp Jack We'll, have a, we'll be having a volunteer meeting on August 10th at 6.30 at the Camp Jack facility here in Harrison. So if you, it would be a great opportunity to learn more about Camp Jack and uh, learn how you can get involved and help out. And of course, I'm sure Al Plapp can give you any information you need about that. As far as concerns, we want to remember the uh, Ben Martin family. Of course, Ben passed away this past week. Uh, there was a visitation this past Wednesday, I believe it is, was, and there will be a private memorial service at a future date. So let's keep that family in our thoughts and prayers. Also, Nancy Howe will be uh, going to uh, have a doctor's consultation this week to uh, consider the treatment options for her cancer. Uh, Carrie Stambaugh is now home. Carrie uh, has been quite sick with COVID. Uh, she, is not, she is now home, but I understand is, is still very sick and, and having some pretty significant sy symptoms. So let's keep, the, let's keep those in our prayers. Charmaine Ledger uh, had a pretty severe break of her ankle. It was several weeks ago, but she's still in quite a bit of pain. I think she is maybe going to start driving some in, in the next few days, but she's, she's going to have a long recovery. So let's make sure and keep her in our thoughts and prayers. Are there other joys and concerns that I have, that have failed to mention? Any, anyone? Anything? Well, let us remember those who have lost loved ones, those facing health-related challenges, and all those who are not able to be with us today. Thanks. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Lord, we come before you today to thank you. Simply put, for everything that you've done, every step you've taken with us, every time you've held us back, every time you've held us, every time you've led us, every time you've guided us, every time you touched our family, every time you kept us safe, we come to thank you. Lord, we love you. And we are so pleased that you have made us one of your own. Lord, there is none like you or beside you. Lord, and I thank you that yes, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, there are sick among us, Lord, far too many for us to name. But Lord, I know that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, can make them whole again. Lord, this virus seems to be like not, no other. Lord, we are baffled by its ability to avoid, to circumvent control. But Lord, I know if anyone 
can. You can. You are the vaccine that it works 100% of the time. Lord, you are the doctor who sees what's really causing the problem. Lord, you are the medicine that makes it all okay. Lord, we have friends and families that are family members that are on ventilators. Lord, we have friends and family members that are considered to be at high risk. But Father, I ask you as humbly as I know how to put a hedge of protection around them. Let nothing that is not of you come up against them. Lord, I ask you to encamp your angels into their rooms, into their cars, all around them because they are there because you sent them they are there because they can protect them. Lord, I ask you to touch this church. Lord, help us be on the same accord. Help us walk in unity. Help us walk in love. Help us walk in peace. Let us be about your business and not ours. Let us do the things that are pleasing in your sight simply because that is the gold standard. Lord, we are not the world. We are yours. And Father, I ask you to hold this congregation close together. Hold us, Father. Let us learn from each other. Let us grow from each other. And Father, make your vision plain for this church. Lord, I ask these blessings in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is, one, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when, when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who, who, he, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to, to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and, te and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up unto him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is the word of God to the people of God.
have you ever been in a dark place? I have. I've spent months there. Sometimes I think I spent years there. And uh, music has helped me, by the grace of God, to find a way out of it. So, if you've been or you're in a dark place, this is for you. Does Jesus care when my heart is deeply for mirth and mirth and joy. Oh, I'm going to have to start again. This, 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 kind of, this is kind of a regular thing, you know? Whew, amateur hour. I'm, I'm glad there's no gong here. Does Jesus care when my heart is pain? joy and the burdens bear and the cares distress and the way goes dreary and the warm. Wow. Does Jesus care when my way is dark with nameless dread and fear as the daylight fades have mercy. I've sung this approximately 40 times in the past two weeks. I think 30 of them being this week. <laughs> Does Jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear and the daylight fades into deep night shades does he care enough to be near oh yes he cares I know he cares his heart is touched with my grief when the days are weary and the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when I try and fail to resist some temptation strong? When for my deep grief I find no relief, though my tears Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me? And my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks. Is it on to him? Does he see? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart touched by my grief when the days are weary the long nights dreary I know my Savior cares oh yes he cares I know he cares his heart is touched by my grief when the days are weary the long it's dreary. I know my Savior cares. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, thank you for an opportunity to come before your people. Lord, thank you for the music. Thank you for the hearts. 
that are so full of your love. Lord, um, it's not easy to come up here and perform. Uh, and sometimes your emotions get the best of you. But that's because we're in a place where we know you are. In your son's name I pray, amen. Well, I have to. I guess I'm, when my grandson was going to school with the Obama girls, I had a grandmommy brag moment, okay. But since my grandnephew has got the uh, one a bronze, and if you knew him, he's a good kid. He really is, and he thanks the Lord for those blessings. I was thinking about his grandmother, my mother-in-law, how proud she would be if she had lived to see this day. So um, I'm not going to hold you long this morning, but I need you to participate in a song with me. Sorry about that, Roger. i got to do another song. So all you need to do is you don't have to worry about knowing the words. Just clap along with me. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. And I promised him that I, I would serve him till I died. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Oh, yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. And I promised him that I I would serve him till I died. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. We got a dancing dog back there. <laughs> I was alone and idle. I was a sinner too. I heard the voice of heaven say there is work to do. I took the master's hand and I joined the Christian band and I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Oh yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. Lord, and I promise him that I, I would serve him till I die. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, little, little Bryce, he's, well, he's really not that little, but little Bryce, he's over there in Tokyo witnessing for the Lord, for what the Lord has done through, through his life. And that's the way we are. We, wherever we are, people should have the sweet aroma that Jesus has been through. Amen? So I'm just really excited about that. Of course, I didn't see the race because we couldn't figure out what time it was on. And I think we slept through it and blah, blah, blah. But we got the message. But we are, if I have to take two fix to keep my eyelids open on Friday, uh, we're going to see that race. Amen? <laughs> Okay, well, today, just a little bit of time, and thank you very much, Elder, for reading the entire book of Ephesians for me. Amen? Um, it's bad when the pastor gives you 1 through 25. Okay, well, anyway, so we're talking about the letter that Paul wrote from jail to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Ephesus. When Paul wrote this letter, he was in prison, but prison back then for Paul wasn't kind of, wasn't like prison today. It was more like home incarceration without the little thing around your ankle, okay? Because Paul was going to be treated a little bit better than his Jewish brothers and sisters that were over there in Galilee because he was a Roman citizen, right? Paul was a Roman citizen. That's the reason why they couldn't crucify Paul because Paul, they didn't crucify Roman citizens. So Paul was beheaded instead. But he was very much very active over at Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus was the capital of the Roman province of Asia. And Paul had turned this into the, his center for the missionary work in that area. So he's always on mission. We talk about Paul's missionary journeys. But wherever Paul went, the purpose was the same, was the same to see people brought to Christ, to see people come to Christ, 
to teach the word and preach the word, knowing that the Holy Spirit of God will do the work that needs to be done. All we have to do is be the conduit. We have to open the door and make sure that, hey, guess what? People know that there is still a God on Zion who still heals and who still saves and who still delivers. Church is not about structures or programs or programs and structures. It's about saving the lost, pure and simple. Somebody did something someplace. That's the reason why you're here today. Somebody stepped up to the plate and taught uh, plate and up to the plate and pre preached a Sunday school class that I was sitting in one day. Somebody did something in, in, in obedience with the Great Commission to go, therefore, and make disciples, teaching them all things that I've commanded unto you. Somebody did something, so now you are sitting here inside this ark of salvation. You have been saved, but you are saved so that you can see somebody else saved. Because somebody, I guarantee you, you are still on this planet because somebody in your arc of influence, somebody in your realm of, of uh, impression, someone influenced, someone who's influenced by you, somebody someplace needs you to step up and be what God has called you to be. It ain't about Joanne, you know, oh yeah, well, you know, she's on the payroll. She's <laughs> Ronnie Ramsey, is it going to be one of those Sundays? <laughs> it's all about each and every one of us being those ministers of reconciliation, those ambassadors for Christ. So Paul's writing this letter to Ephesus, and one thing, just a footnote here about Ephesus. Ephesus, they had, at Ephesus, they had constructed what was considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and that was the temple that was uh, dedicated to the goddess of fertility, Diana. This is one of the reasons why when the church began to grow and people came from other cults and paganism and all that stuff, Paul had to be very careful about what he said and who he said it to because, see, the women in this area would have known about the temple prostitution that was occurring because they had been taught that this is the way they worship God, by having these sexual interactions. So Paul had to be very careful that that did not get into the church of Jesus Christ. That's the reason why you read one ep uh, epistle, it says something, one thing about women and their role, and then you'll read another one and it says something different. Paul didn't have an easy time in Ephesus. The Jews there, of course, in the synagogue where he typically went when he first got to town, they had rejected him. So what he did was he went to this school of, uh, called Tyrannius, and he would teach the scriptures to whoever would listen. While he was there, his ministry at Ephesus was marked by several spirit-filled miracles. That's pretty cool because miracles have a way of getting people's attention. You know, I was uh, in, a, in a workshop once for church planting back when I thought God wanted me to plant a church. And one thing they talked about, and this was a seminary, they said that when they go into a community or area and they plant a church, there's something about going in and taking back what the enemy has stolen, that causes all sorts of miracles to happen. It's like God is so pleased that we are doing what he told us to do, that we are being obedient, that he releases the spirit in a whole nother level. So there we were, or there Paul was over in Ephesians, I mean Ephesus, and these miracles happened, and what happened was the people became converted to Christianity in such numbers that the people that made the idols there were upset because nobody was buying any idols. Everybody was worshiping this invisible God to the point that they actually had a riot. The backdrop for this story can be found in Acts 20, 17 through 38, where Paul warns the church elders at Ephesus that there's going to be some problems coming up. There's going to be some savage wolves who are going to come up inside the church, but also from the outside, they're going to come in. And he's warning them like a person would warn a, sh warn a shepherd that his flock is under, under threat, that something is coming this way. Beware of this. Take caution with this. Because one of the things that the enemy likes to do is 
he likes to attack our unity. He doesn't want us on the same accord. He doesn't want three of us standing together and praying for a situation. He doesn't want us all to be moving in the same direction. If you look in Acts, you will see that there, they said signs and wonders followed them wherever they went, but you will also see that the word, the phrase, in one accord, in one accord, the church was in one accord. When conflict arose, there was a problem, and the word could, I mean, the spirit could not go forth. But when the church is operating the way that it should, as this well-oiled machine that's moving in the same direction, church can, the church can change the world. The church can change the world. When we are operating and moving in the same direction, no, you will never get along with everybody in here. You certainly won't get along with me. But you don't get along with everybody in here, but that's not the purpose. Because it's not about Joanne. We are here so that we can rough the rough edges off each other, rub them off. That person with that personality, oh, 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 it drives me crazy. Well, now it's time for you to say, what is it about them that drives you crazy? Maybe that's something you need to work on. And then if you do, then when you go out into the world, you run into the same type of personality, you are prepared. We are in here, once again, to do the basic mission that God has called us to do, the fundamental, the most important mission we can do, because we're talking about the difference between life and death. And that is to see a soul saved. If we were under attack like the Alamo, if we are the Alamo and outside there is Santa Anta's army trying to get over the wall, we will put every man, woman, and child on that wall with a weapon to keep them from getting in. We would, nobody would sleep, or when they did, we would work together because we're going to keep the enemy out. That's the way we should be now about keeping the enemy out of our lives. We have to be unified. We have to be in one accord. Because, see, in here things happen where they don't happen any other place. In here is where the blessings begin. In here is where the healings begin. I heard a, uh, 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 Gary Gunterson, I heard him talk once, and I'm not getting the background of his credentials. He's very credentialed. But he said, he said, there's very few places in this society where a person can come to simply be blessed. He said, the church is it. He said, all we, all we do when people come through that, that morning, I always love talking to the greeters, because all we're here to do is to bless you. We don't want your money. We don't want your time. We don't want your car. Somebody did tell me a story about somebody called the pastor one time. They really need the car, and he gave them their car. Well, I haven't gotten to that point in my ministry yet. But <laughs> we just simply want to bless you. We want you, when you leave here, to feel good about yourself, to feel good about us, but most importantly, to feel good about God. That's all we're talking about here. We're not trying to collect your money so that we can build a, so that I could get another jet, not that I have one right now. Got a Jetta, but not a jet. Um, all we want to do is bless you. And how do we do this? We do this by you share your story with us, or it can be the other way around. We share our story with you. You share your story with us. Then we walk through our stories together. You are never alone because we're family. We are one. We all represent the body of Christ. That is who we are. We are the church that is not built with human hands. So this church um, was commended over in Romans, Ephesus. Uh, Jesus himself dictated a letter to John to comment on the fact that the church at Ephesus did listen and didn't tolerate false teachings. And they reunited their love for God. 
You see, in this sanctuary, we are set, aside, set us apart. We are sanctified, which simply means set apart. I know when I was growing up, and my mother would say, oh yeah, it's a sanctified church, so we kind of speed up as we went by. Um, <laughs> one time I told her, Kim, I was in a church where they were wa washing feet. She told me, you need to find another church. I don't... <laughs> I don't know what all that's about, but we are all part of the body of Christ. And we need to walk the way, we need to walk the walk and talk the talk. When I was a much younger woman, um, they had a banquet and my daughter at that time, she was, must have been like about five, she would sing solos in the church, if you can imagine that. And um, they had a church, um, auxiliary had an event and they asked my daughter to come and be the guest soloist. <laughs> so there she is, five years old, singing this little song. And after it was over, the people began talking, you know, just, you know, just conversation. And this one woman who was unmarried, uh, she kept talking, oh yeah, you guys need to bring some men in the church because I need a husband, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I, ne <laughs> I never forgot. What happened then was is that one of the deacons, he was a World War II veteran, Brother McCracklin. He stood up and he said, we are Christian people. We don't need to talk like this. We need more Brother McCracklins out there to remind us who we are and what we are, whose we are, who do we belong to, and what are we about, what's most important to us. People willing to take a stand for Jesus. A few years ago when I was down in Texas, I went to a community event or something, and I was sitting at this table with some people who had gone to the local Disciples of Christ church, but they no longer went to anybody's church. They were talking to somebody else. They said, oh yeah, I love going to that church because you can just believe whatever you want to believe. Man, I could have crawled under the table. I was so embarrassed. Oh, yeah, you just believe whatever you want to believe. And, and, and I thought, I said, you know, we have beliefs, and we need to hold to our beliefs. We need to understand that it's Jesus Christ and him crucified and resurrected, that his blood covers our sin so that our sin is as far from us as the east is from the west, and therefore, because our sins are squared away through his blood, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace of God and ask for help in time of trouble, that we know that we have a home in glory, that we don't have to worry about what happens when we close our eyes for that last time, that his angels will already be in the room to escort us over to the other side. Yes, what we do here matters, and what we emphasize. We can't just be, as Paul said, just willy-nilly like infants. You know, whatever people come in and tell us, we believe. Whatever, blah, blah, blah. You know, we are like every wind of doctrine being blown to and fro. You know, if somebody wants to say Jesus has a third eye, you know, third eye, I think, is that Buddhist or... What is that, Kim? The people with the third eye. Okay, somebody. Anyway, uh, Kim's not doing her homework. Um, <laughs> who? What'd you say, Kathy? Yeah, Hindu. Somebody's got a third eye, and the God does, right? You know, it's like a horror show, but that's who they worship. That is not up. So if they want to say Jesus has a third eye, let's go ahead and put a third eye on him so we can appeal to those people. No! We believe that he went to the cross and on the third day he rose again, amen? With all power in his hands. No, these are non-negotiables. This is foundational to who we are. This is the reason why I stand before you. Because it's my job to help us get keep it together so that I know the rest of you can't do this full time. That's okay. 
Help me help you do the work that God has called us to do because we are living in a dying world. We are living in a situation that none of us thought would ever exist, that there would be a pandemic that you can't get rid of. People are dying all across the board. But do they know Jesus Christ? The finished work on the cross. You see, we have been called by God. We have been called by God to do the work that he has called us to do. And if we have been called by God, what that means is God is still speaking. God does not have laryngitis. He's still speaking and talking to us. I once heard a preacher remark, God no longer speaks. That was only in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Not for now. You know, we don't have God speaking. So then another preacher said, well, if God doesn't speak and you've never heard his voice, what are you doing in the pulpit? Sorry. <laughs> but, he, if he, but he has spoken to you. That's why you're here. Yes, he has spoken to you, and you are one of his own. You are one of his adopted children. You're not bio, just like some biological accident. No, no, no. He saw you, and he said, I want that one. He said, I want that one to be one of my own. And that makes all the difference in the world. So down here in verse, back to our chapter 4, Paul writes, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. That's NIV translation. In, in the New Revised Standard Translation, <clears throat> New Revised Standard Version, it says, I beg you to lead a life worthy of calling to which you have been called. But I got to go back to King James and my grandfather where it says, I beseech you to walk worthy of your calling to which you were called. To walk. I like that because you got to do something. You're not just, yeah, I live my life. Da, 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 I'm doing the right thing. No, no, no. Walk it out. Paul loves to talk about people walking it out. That you got to move in a direction. As a matter of fact, that's how we can tell something is alive because it moves. If you're not moving, if you're in the same place that you were this time last year, something's not right, something's not alive, something's not growing. We need to be moving, we need to walk in love, we need to walk in the light, we need to walk in wisdom, wisdom. we need to walk circumspect, we need to walk in peace, we need to walk in unity with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love. Sounds a lot like the fruit of the Spirit, yes. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Fruit of the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes to reside with you, your Spirit and the Holy Spirit, you produce fruit. Not fruits, fruit. People know that you've been with God because you're exhibiting that fruit. There's a problem when you show up and everybody wants to leave because you got no fruit, amen? There's a problem when you show up, everybody knows it's going to be chaos. <laughs> you got no fruit, amen? Producing that fruit. And if you don't produce the fruit, you're going to end up pruned. Jesus talks about it over there in John. You will be pruned either way, even if you're producing fruit, so that you may bear more fruit. How many farmers I got in here? Okay, just Jim Milam, poor Jim Milam, nobody else. You know, anybody grow a vegetable, a tomato plant, an onion, anything? I don't know. Virgil, what did you, what did you grow? Oh, you're trying to tell me about a time. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> Pray for my marriage. I mean, <laughs> obviously, I'm not going to get through this sermon today, so I will make this a two-parter, Kathy, you know, because I'm still stuck on my fruit. <laughs> but what I will say in closing 
is, is that when we produce this fruit, we are actually producing the very virtues of Christ. Can't be better than that. Because we want to make every effort to remain in unity with the spirit of the living God. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you once again for showing me you know so much more than I do. <laughs> Lord, I thank you for being with me. Lord, and I ask you to bless my people here. Lord, bless us individually and collectively. Lord, bless their homes, bless their families, Lord, in such a way that they know you have been through. Lord, I ask these blessings in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let us stand, and this is our invitation. And... Um, I'm not feeling yet. And of course, you know, I only got one more month, Jim Milam, that I could keep saying, oh yeah, I'm the new pastor, so I haven't been able to figure it out. Well, after a year, they don't give you as much grace. Uh, but I haven't quite got my groove yet. I haven't gotten quite where I want to be yet in terms of invitations. But I am going to say this. I am going to say that if something that was said caused you to think in a slightly different way about the Lord or about our church, come join us in this ark of salvation. Come help us do what we feel God has called us to do. Because it really is all about him and not about us. I told Charlotte that I had a special little part in the sermon today for her, but I didn't get to it. I was going to tell Charlotte, I said, when he talks about one God, one baptism, one spirit, all that one, Count them up. There's seven of them. Seven ones, the numbers of completion. Yeah, God is a good God. He's a merciful God. And I tell you something else, I can't think. This is the best deal in the universe. You don't have to bring any oranges and all that stuff. I think that's what they do with Buddhism or Hinduism or something. Bring an orange or a dove or something. Got to go outside and catch a pigeon, pigeon and put them in some bleach and then take them over because you didn't have a dove. I don't know if that works. The pigeon probably be dead, don't you think, Ronnie Ramsey? Yeah. Um, all you have to do is come. Come and serve the God of love. You know, some people talk about Christianity being a very bloody, you know, talk about the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ. But what I like to think about, especially when we're about to do communion, that back in the Old Testament, um, when they wanted the death angel to go over, when the children of Israel were about to uh, leave Egypt, they put the blood of the lamb over the door. And that lamb had to be perfect. No blemishes, male. Well, Jesus is the blood of the lamb whose blood is over our door. So the death will never come our way again. I don't know. To me, that's hallelujah time. Thank you, Lord. Let us sing. Amen. Somebody came. <laughs> I'm all giggly. Okay, so this is Jan. And Jan, you want to address the church? Uh, glad to be back. Amen. 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 <laughs> so Jan and I have been talking, and uh, 
She told me that um, she's anxious to be in working for the church. And uh, I told her, at least take a month off before I get to you. Yeah. So uh, here she, yeah, she did. And here she is. And I understand your family is, uh, uh, was members of the church. And yes, and that garden over there. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Dedicated to her mom. So I'm not sure what the procedure is after this other than welcoming you back. Anybody help me out, elders? Okay, all right. <laughs> um, did you by chance bring a mask? I did. Okay, I did. I let us put our mask on and we're gonna give her the hand, the fellow, right hand of fellowship or left hand, whatever, not your foot, of fellowship. and <laughs> Welcome her back into the congregation which is a fantastic thing. And let us have our let us have our benediction. Lord, back over in Ephesians, where we were talking about. Paul talks about the mystery, the mystery, the mystery. And the mystery is, while people love to talk about the Jews are God's chosen people, the mystery that he came to realize is that it's God's desire that all should be saved, Gentile and Jew. And he closes his, this, this section of the book up with this doxology, this praise to God for the appreciation for this mystery. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you may ask or think, through the power which works within us, to God be the glory in the church by Jesus Christ. Let the church say, Amen, Amen. amen.